This is no BS stuff, it really does work. I could have quit when I was 20 if I knew this stuff. I really had a lot of difficulty because I was always bored. Good morning, friends. I used to smoke cigarettes and I quit the hard way. Over the last few years of me studying biology and pharmacology, I came across many tools that could have made that process much easier for me. In this video, I'm going to describe them to you. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video and comment on the video for the sake of the algorithm. Now let's get started. First of all, let's break down why quitting smoking is so difficult, beginning with nicotine and then talking about the habit. Nicotine affects two neurotransmitter systems that are very crucial to us. Nicotine is a agonist of what's called the nicotinic cholinergic receptors. This affects receptors in the brain that belong to the acetylcholine neurotransmitter system. These receptors have two names depending on how they respond to natural chemicals in the world. One group of them are called the nicotinic cholinergic receptors, the others are called the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. The nicotinic cholinergic receptors upregulate as a response to agonism. So what does this mean? As you smoke, unlike many other situations in life, these receptors, every time they feel nicotine, they upregulate, producing a positive feedback loop where the smoker enjoys the smoking more because the nicotine binds to more receptors the more they smoke. So there's a positive feedback loop there. Moreover, when they try to quit smoking, they have a couple of issues. One is they have a lot of receptors available to sense the lack of agonism. Second of all, their neurotransmitter system, the acetylcholine system, had nicotine available for so long. So potentially these people may have dysfunctional cholinergic systems in the sense that they're not producing much acetylcholine because they didn't need it because they were dependent on this foreign substance nicotine for so long. Moreover, when smokers quit smoking, they feel unusually, like they feel brain fog, unusually slow thinking and so on. And this is for real reasons because they were high performing previously because of the PED, that is nicotine. It's a performance enhancing drug. It does enhance performance and without it, they don't just go to baseline. They have like slightly worse function than normal people for a couple of weeks at least. And during that time, it is quite frustrating to not think properly. Second, nicotine through its nicotinic cholinergic agonism causes transmission of dopamine. Dopamine has two issues that we have to talk about. One, whenever dopamine is transmitted while you're doing something, it habituates you to what you're doing and makes you like it more. So if you smoke a cigarette and you have something physical in your hand, while you're feeling dopamine, you start to associate this feeling of holding the cigarette with the dopamine. Moreover, the dopaminergic system is highly conserved in the nervous system. When the system feels that there's too much dopamine signaling, it downregulates the receptors as well as enzymes that produce dopamine. And it will certainly sense that for somebody that you smokes a cigarette frequently throughout the day. They will have basically a downregulation of the dopamine system in some way as a response to take into account the fact that they're smoking all day. Your system has to control this because dopamine, unlike the acetylcholine neurotransmitter, is sort of toxic to receptors. It is excitatory and so excitatory it causes what's called excitotoxicity. So the dopamine receptors downregulate and the enzymes may downregulate as a response to the smoking. Once the person quits the smoking, the receptors remain downregulated for a period of time during which that person has sort of like mild anhedonia. Like the, the euphoria someone might feel in the morning, it is not there anymore. And that's why a lot of ex-smokers tend to drink coffee or drink caffeine drinks. They're trying to get that dopamine hit somehow. They often try to eat as well. They often overeat, they often gain a lot of fat. And the reason is they're trying to replace, trying to accommodate, deal with this low dopamine signaling. They don't have to do all of this. There's a much easier way. But before we move on to the tools, we have to discuss the habituation of smoking. As I mentioned earlier, the dopamine signaling habituates you to smoking. Well. One of the problems when you quit is that you physically feel that there's nothing to do with your hands or your mouth. You're, you're bored. Normal people are bored all the time. They just never realize you could be so entertained just sitting around with a cigarette. And you do realize. So this is the reason, by the way, that people are able to use like uh, vapes with 0% nicotine and quit smoking, but they can't quit the vape because of that habit. And that's also why when smokers go blind, they usually quit smoking within a couple of years. The sight of the smoke and the habit is very much integral to the addiction. So this protocol has five points, beginning with dopamine. Regarding dopamine, if you inhibit dopamine signaling, there's less of a potential to do addictive behavior because for example, if you go smoke a cigarette, you won't feel that great after it. You'll just taste the cigarette, but won't feel the good feeling from it. If you inhibit dopamine acutely, it does that. So it reduces addictive tendencies acutely. It does this in rodents, it does this in humans. There's always the case. When you lower dopamine, people do less addictive stuff. And that's why when people take dopaminergic drugs, they sometimes develop new addictions to pornography, to gambling, you know, these kind of things. So if I were to quit smoking now, I would actually want to inhibit dopamine signaling for a couple of weeks, maybe until maybe a month, until I feel you know, okay with the successfully quit smoking. 
And then I may actually want to raise dopamine signaling in a circadian fashion to get me through the next couple of months. If somebody was to raise the dopamine later, they would use something like a short-acting amphetamine or a short-acting Ritalin, what's called Ritalin, or uh, Wellbutrin, for example. In fact, there's another formulation of Wellbutrin called Zyban, which is actually FDA approved for the treatment of uh, smoking cessation. Now, why bupropion is particularly attractive for that purpose, the chemical ingredient Wellbutrin, is because it is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor like Ritalin, but it also blocks cholinergic receptors. So it doesn't really allow you to feel the full connection with the nicotine. Now that's not, I do not recommend blocking cholinergic receptors. My idea works way better than that. So my point though here about the dopamine is this. First you want to inhibit it, and then when you feel okay with that, you want to raise it slightly in a circadian fashion. Second, the plasticity. For those that don't realize, while you're smoking cigarettes, you are, your brain is more plastic, especially every time you smoke the cigarette. When there's dopamine transmission, growth factors in the brain increase slightly. So the brain is a bit more malleable. This is one of the ways that dopamine habituates you to stuff. And when you quit smoking, you've just made your brain comparatively rigid but you've left it rigid at the point that you had that habit. So to allow you to get around that habit, you have to increase the plasticity in the short term. And SSRI will not do this powerfully enough. There's only two options really, I believe. One is ibogaine. If you've tried ibogaine before, I do not recommend it. It's cardiotoxic, very dangerous, and not better really than the other choice that I'm mentioning here. But if you try ibogaine and you to smoke cigarettes, you'll notice after you do an ibogaine flood dose, you will not be able to enjoy a cigarette for at least two or three days. And for the next couple of weeks, you will not see, feel the same kind of dopaminergic effect from music or from smoking or from coffee or anything else. But there's a better option, and this one I discovered myself, which is cerebrolysin. If you use cerebrolysin at 10 milliliters a day for a few days, by the sixth or seventh day at the very least, if you smoke a cigarette, you will notice that it no longer affects you properly. It, it, in fact, your tolerance to the cigarette really rises while you can't get much benefit from it. That is the effect of neurogenesis. So it's really a two in one. Not only does cerebrolysin increase plasticity acutely and dramatically, but it also inhibits some dopaminergic signaling with a trailing effect. It does both with a trailing effect. So for example, say you stop using cerebrolysin at 10 milliliters a day after two weeks, two weeks in for, on the 14th day, you will feel a little bit different until the end of them that month for sure. And you'll have a little bit less dopaminergic signaling for at least a week and a half or two weeks. So there's a trailing effect to it. By the way, how I would do this myself is I would begin the cerebrolysin three or four days before quitting. And once I quit, I'll move to the next step here, which is upregulate the cholinergic system. What I would do personally is I would procure donapazil, which is a drug that inhibits the breakdown of acetylcholine, the natural neurotransmitter that binds to those nicotinic cholinergic receptors. I would start donapazil at 5 milligrams a day, once a day in the morning, and a few days in, I would raise it to 10 milligrams, uh, like four or five days in, if I can tolerate it. And if that's fine, I would wait four or five days again and raise it to 15 milligrams. And I would eventually raise it to 20 milligrams because it will be very powerful at that dose. I would also begin supplementing with CDP choline or city choline as well as phosphatidylcholine. I would take at least 500 milligrams from each, although I may want to get a 1.5 grams total. There's no toxicity level, it's not a concern. Next, I would begin dosing alpha GPC in the morning. Alpha GPC is a kind of choline that causes reserve choline that's stored in the body to be released. So if you take the phosphatidylcholine and CDP choline, you'll be much more sensitive to the alpha GPC. So I usually take between 100 to 300 milligrams in the morning, and I, you can redose it, say, at noon. Some people can tolerate very high doses. You may be able to in the beginning, but you will not be able to once the donapazil really becomes active in your system. You'll start to notice that the alpha GPC is really powerful. Next, I would supplement with 500 milligrams of uridine monophosphate also in the morning, and I would also take between 800 milligrams to 1,600 milligrams of piracetam in the morning. Probably I would only take 800 milligrams, to be honest with you, because this whole system is already very upregulated. So what's the goal here with this cholinergic system manipulation? Well, first of all, it's going to remove that brain fog issue that you develop from the smoking cessation. Whatever symptoms you're feeling really from the cho less cholinergic agonism will be removed with this intense of a protocol. This is very intense. You'll notice that. Also, if you try to smoke, if you fail and you do go smoke a cigarette, the cigarette will be so powerful, you won't be able to finish it because that system is so activated. Next, a fourth point. I wasn't actually going to include this myself. I didn't think it was so valuable, but by accident, I came across a paper showing that N-acetylcysteine supplementation can actually improve the recovery from smoking in humans. So if that's the case, I would recommend you use my hydrophilic 
anti-inflammatory stack that I made a video about a few days ago and add 500 milligrams of tatka or adka to it. I didn't mention that in the video because I'm doing a separate video on tatka and adka, but add that to it and take it three times a day. It should make a difference. It's shown in papers, although I wouldn't naturally think that it would make that much of a difference like the other parts here. Finally, the habit. What should you do about the habit? This itchy feeling that you need something in your hand or something like that. Well, I advise you not to take a vape. If you use a vape, you're not breaking that smoking habit thing very much. The enemy is not nicotine, the enemy is the smoke. And vape causes a lot of inflammation. There are a lot of studies on this. And by the way, the vapes and the vape juice are not regulated. And even if they were regulated, this vaping process seems to cause inflammation in the lungs. So instead, I would recommend that you actually tackle your problem. Your problem is smoking, not nicotine. So I would choose either a nicotine pouch or snus. Snus is a Swedish kind of tobacco that is not fermented. The Swiss one is not so dangerous as the American oral tobaccos. It's only associated with pancreatic cancer risk, mildly, and pancreatic cancer is very much uh, associated with adrenaline levels. So that might actually explain it instead of the actual snus. They're not associated with oral cancer. You don't have to worry about that too much. Now, you could start with snus if you like tobacco, if you like the taste of tobacco. For example, I still use snus. I enjoy it and I don't think it's detrimental to my life. If you like the taste of tobacco, I would choose a snus. And I would begin with a high nicotine snus. For example, one of my favorite ones is called Lab 06. It's a strong one, but there's many other recommendations. Maybe I should make a video on that later. But also, so you could begin with snus if you like the taste of tobacco and then you could switch over to nicotine pouches, which are plant matter that's sprayed with nicotine. Or if you don't like the taste of tobacco, you can begin with those nicotine pouches. These pouches and the snus will be particularly strong on you because of the donapazil and all the cholinergic stimulation. You may not be able to keep it in your mouth more than five minutes, to be honest with you. Really, these tools would make it so much easier to quit smoking, especially with the snus or nicotine pouch and everything else there, the plasticity and the cholinergic stimulation and dopaminergic stimulation later. With these tools, I could have quit smoking way before I did. I just didn't know about them. And not many other people know about them, to be honest. Most people are not that helpful. You go to a doctor, he gives you one thing, well butrin. I mean, they don't have any kind of imagination. They don't understand because they've never done it and never taken the drugs in the first place, probably never smoked, you know what I mean? So sometimes you need to talk to somebody who's been there and, and felt those things and tried cerebralized and tried these different things to imagine what could be possible. Anyway, guys, I hope this was helpful for you. I just want to remind you, initially, we want to inhibit dopamine signaling a little bit and increase neurogenesis. We use cerebralized for that. Then, maybe later on, a few weeks later, when we're over the smoking thing, we might raise dopamine signaling a few days a week, maybe five days a week in the morning, just to relieve some of that stress. Once we quit, we upregulate the cholinergic system. And finally, after quitting and upregulating the cholinergic system, maybe by a day or two, we introduce either nicotine pouches or snus, and they could be switched to nicotine pouches in the end, so you have no carcinogenic effect. Guys, I hope this was helpful for you. If you know somebody who smokes, recommend this video to them. This is no BS stuff, it really does work. I could have quit in, I could have quit when I was 20 if I knew this stuff. I really had a lot of difficulty because I was always bored and also because I didn't know what the nicotine was doing to my brain. When I would quit it, my brain was not as sharp and I was, my thinking was not as clear. I didn't understand anything about the cholinergic system. And by the way, I have a series on the cholinergic system. If you'd like to watch it and learn more about the system, just look at my playlist. There's one called the cholinergic series or something like that. Anyway, guys, I hope this was helpful for you and I hope to see you again tomorrow.